I was always fascinated by machines ever since I was a kid. Uh, the first time I saw a telephone and a television, I had to ask my mom, you know, how, how does the telephone work? How's the, how does the TV work? And I found out very quickly that people have, generally speaking, no idea how these things work, and I, I just couldn't understand. I had to know. I had to find out. I got very interested in electronics and I wanted to build my, my own devices and, and play with them and experiment. But this was kind of problematic because um, I was raised by a single mom on welfare. Uh, we were very poor and electronics is a, is a very expensive hobby. You constantly have to buy expensive parts, uh, parts which were even more expensive in, in the 1990s. Um, but eventually I, I discovered computers. Um, we, we had an old 386 at home, and it had uh, QBasic on it. And I started to discover the world of programming. And I discovered, to my amazement, that computers were sort of the ultimate machines. There's an infinite world of possibilities to what you can build with programming. And you're not limited by parts or real-world quantities. You know, the only limit is, is your imagination and uh, the time you're, you're willing to, to put into this. And uh, yeah, I started programming really seriously when I was about 15. Uh, I wanted to make games like, like a lot of teenagers, and I started to learn C++ because that's what was used in, in the game industry. And uh, I was never focused enough to actually complete any of my game development projects at the time, uh, but I discovered that I love programming for, for its own sake as a, as a creative outlet. And I think, if, if you program enough, uh, very quickly you, you start to run into limitations. Uh, most mainstream languages have a number of words. And very quickly, you know, you, you want to express something and you find that the languages you're using don't really have the concepts necessary to express what you're thinking. And I think it's, it's kind of natural. As a programmer, you get to a point where you would like to maybe create your own programming language. I, I wanted to do that too. I wanted to understand how programming languages are made. And so eventually, in university, I went on to, uh, to study compiler design and to get a PhD in compiler design. And during my PhD, I, I learned how, how to make a mean compiler, but I realized that I don't really know what, what my ultimate language should be like. P programming language design is actually really hard. Um, and I think it takes a lot of experimentation to really build uh, good programming language. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about Zeta VM, which is um, sort of my contribution to the area of programming language design. So I, deci I decided I wasn't going to create uh, the ultimate programming language. Instead, I was going to create uh, my ultimate virtual machine to build programming languages on. Uh, so Zeta VM is, is a VM for uh, dynamic programming languages. Uh, some of its primary goals are to make language crea creation and experimentation more accessible, accessible to people with only a basic knowledge of programming. Uh, it's also my attempt to explore a few risky ideas in uh, virtual machine design to do things that maybe fly in the face of commonly accepted wisdom today to try and shake things up. And I don't know if Zeta VM will ever catch on and become uh, a mainstream piece of software, but I think at the very least, if I can demonstrate uh, that some of these ideas work well, it's going to inspire other systems and some of the ideas will spread to other implementations. Uh, so some notable features of uh, Zeta VM, it has a text-based image file format. It has built-in support for dynamic typing. It has first-class bytecode. Um, an optimizing interpreter, and it has multi-language support built in. So I'm going to explain uh, all these things in, in this presentation. Um, so the basic data types supported by Zeta VM are booleans, integers, floats, objects. It has an object model that resembles uh, JavaScript, 
And the reason I made that choice is because I think this object model that's used by JavaScript is also similar to the object model that's used by PHP and uh, Python and a lot of other languages. And having support for it at the VM level makes it very easy to implement languages that fit sort of in that family of languages that are like, like Python and in JavaScript and Lua and, and so on. And everything else in the VM is, is built uh, using these basic types by composing them together. Um, yeah, you, you might be wondering why dynamic typing. Maybe you're someone who really likes strongly typed, statically typed languages, and you hate dynamic typing, and you're wondering why, why would you even do that? Well, I think that the reason is that if you have support for dynamic typing at the VM level, you can still very easily implement a statically typed language that will run on Zeta VM and is going to perform well. But if the VM does not have support for dynamic typing and you want to implement Dynamic, a dynamically typed language on it is going to be really difficult and it's going to perform poorly. Um, so textual image format, what, what do I mean by this? Well, ZetaVM takes some inspiration from Smalltalk. Smalltalk uh, is a, a seminal programming language that's influenced the design of many other languages. And it had this concept of an image, which is you could suspend the execution of a program and store the entire heap, all the objects, all the memory uh, into a file on disk. And then you could restore that and resume the execution of a program where you had left off. Uh, so Zeta has a, a textual file format, which is sort of its native way of representing programs, packages, and, and data on disk. Uh, it's a format that resembles JSON with the difference that it allows circular references. Uh, so it really represents a graph of objects that can have circular references to, uh, to one another. And this can be used uh, to represent both code and plain data. Uh, the reason I chose to go with a textual format as opposed to a binary format is largely because I wanted to make uh, the VM more accessible uh, for people who want to implement their own language and who uh, maybe wouldn't feel comfortable with just uh, having to generate um, a binary format, and it, in a sense, I also think that a textual format is more future-proof. It's uh, easier to extend later on. So this is an example of what uh, a Zeta uh, image file might look like. So here we have a definition of a sum function, and we're just uh, giving it a name. Uh, it has a list of parameters, uh, x and y, and uh, it also has uh, inside a list of, in, of bytecode instructions, and the bytecode instructions are just described using objects. Uh, here we're getting the two local variables, x and y, and then we're, we're adding them in, in a stack machine sort of way, and then returning a result. And at the end of our package, we're just uh, producing an object, which is basically the, the list of symbols that are exported by this package. So here we're exporting the, the sum function. So I mentioned uh, first class bytecode. What do I mean by this? Um, so Zeta takes some inspiration from, from Lisp also in the code is, is data sort, sort of sense. So Zeta functions are, are objects, uh, but not as in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, functions sort of pretend to be object. JavaScript pretends that everything is an object when it's not. Uh, but in Zeta, functions literally are objects, as in they're negative objects. So what this means is you can generate code on the fly. If you compose together objects uh, and they have the right fields and everything, you can build a function. You can build bytecode in memory, and then you can call this as a function. Um, and you can also go and, and poke into uh, the code of existing functions and and possibly uh, modify it and, and introspect it on the fly. So this is actually a really powerful feature. Uh, so just, just a quick example of what you can do with this. Uh, you can implement uh, functional style partial evaluation or currying as, um, as a bytecode modification, sort of. So um, yeah, hopefully this is not too difficult to understand. This is a function that curry is another function. So it takes this argument, a function, and the value that you want to do the currying with for, for the last function argument. 
And what it does is just it creates a new entry point for the queried function. And in, in this entry point, we're going to push on the stack the value of the arguments that we want to query with. We're going to assign this argument to uh, the correct local variable. And then we jump to the existing entry point for the function. So we're just creating a new function uh, with a new entry point that does the querying and that jumps to the existing function entry point. And this is sort of an example of what you can do with this. Uh, this is for, for sound generation. It's a function that uh, produces a sine wave as a function of time. So there's a function f in there that takes time and frequency and returns the amplitude of the, the sine wave. And here we can curry uh, the sine function uh, in function of the, the frequency. So you can, you can call sine with uh, a frequency like 300, and it's going to return a new function that uh, only takes the time and produces a 300 hertz sine wave. Um, so you might be wondering, why would you want to use currying to do that? Can't you use closures to do this anyways? Well, the point is, you can implement a new language on ZetaVM that doesn't even have closures. And I could curry functions in your language uh, without knowing anything about its implementation. If it runs on ZetaVM, uh, you can do currying without having to care about the details of how it's implemented. Um, and moving on, the, the jitterpreter. Um, so Zeta has an interpreter internally. It doesn't yet generate machine codes. Um, so there's there's kind of a, a problem, right? Because I, I presented this, this uh, bytecode format that's all made out of objects in memory. You can create bytecode by uh, creating objects. And that looks like it's probably really inefficient, right? Like if you write an interpreter that just traverses a graph of objects with all these property lookups, all this indirection, uh, it's going to be dog slow. Uh, so the solution I found to this problem was to uh, create an interpreter that lazily translates the object-based bytecode into a flat, uh, compact internal representation. So basically, it's an interpreter that does some amount of JIT compilation uh, and some amount of optimization at the same time. And this delivers a speed up of about 25 times over the naive interpreter implementation, which is fast enough to do some, some fun things like audio signal generation. Uh, it's getting to the point where it's nearly as fast as CPython. And I think that within the next few months, it's going to, to become very soon much faster. Um, as part of Zeta VM, I also implemented sort of a, a toy language to run on this VM. Uh, this language is called Plush. It's inspired by JavaScript and Lua. And the main goals of this language were, were to bootstrap and test the system, and also to serve as an implementation example for, for people who come to Zeta VM and who are wondering how do I implement a language on this. I wanted to have a simple language that people could look at with an implementation that's really well commented so that people can just um, modify this implementation if, if they want to. Um, there's currently two implementations of the Plush language. There's one called C++, uh, which is written in C++. And it takes Plush source files as inputs and produces uh, those Zeta image files as outputs. So it produces like a compiled package. And there's also a self-hosted uh, Plush implementation, which is itself written in Plush. Uh, and this is the plush language package. So I'll explain in a moment uh, why this is useful or interesting. So Zeta has support for multiple languages natively by delegating the parsing of source code to uh, language packages. So this means you can add support for your language to the virtual machine in a way that feels native uh, by implementing a language package. So when you write a, a source file and you want it to run on Zeta, you uh, begin your source file by having a, a language line which tells Zeta which parser to load to parse your source file. And Zeta will call into this package to parse your code. So the reason that there is both a C++ plush implementation and a self-hosted package is that the C++ compiler was basically needed to bootstrap the system. The C++ compiler was needed so that we could have a way to write code on this system without directly writing the, 
the bytecode by hand. Um, so this is an example of a, of a little uh, plush source file that uh, has a Fibonacci function. And the first line in the file basically is the, the language line, which tells plush, in order to parse this source file, you will need to load uh, the plush package. And then, so Zeta loads the plush package, and it passes the source for this file to this package. And this will parse the source code, generate objects in memory that represents the intermediate representation for this code, and then execute that on the VM. So the point is, if you write your own language package, you could make your own language for this VM that's going to, to feel native in this sort of way. Uh, so I've presented the things that are already implemented in uh, Zeta VM so far. I also have some, some pretty ambitious plans for what I want to do next, where I want to go next uh, with this virtual machine. Uh, some of these ideas might actually seem pretty out there, but I think they're actually uh, fairly realistic. So Zeta is going to have a package manager. Uh, what's going to be maybe different from other package managers is that it's going to be integrated into the, the VM itself. So packages will be downloaded automatically uh, when they're needed without you needing to, to tell the package manager to go fetch the package. Um, and the reason why this is particularly interesting is because the, the killer feature of Zeta VM, so to speak, will be that you can make your new language accessible to everyone instantly. So you, can you will be able to write a language package for Zeta VM and then push it to the package manager. And as soon as you push it, uh, you can tell your friends, you know, my package is at this address, and they can start writing code in your language and run it on Zeta VM in a way that will feel native, so to speak. Um, another interesting aspect is that the packages will be versioned and immutable. So that means once you push a package uh, to, to the package manager, it will have an address, and that address will be fixed. So if you push a new version of the package, it will have a new version number and so on. And the reason for this is so that packages that you depend on cannot change under you. That makes it less likely for, for code to, to break. And the reason I'm talking about this is, is because I have an ambitious goal with this project, which is to explore ways to, to mitigate the phenomenon that's known as code rot. Um, I think code rot is actually one of the biggest problems in software development today. Uh, it's something that's kind of accepted as normal, which is kind of strange in a sense. Uh, basically, co code breaks constantly. Even if you don't touch a piece of code, if you write a piece of code now and you try to run this piece of code, it's possible in a couple of months it's not going to work anymore because some of the dependencies will have changed. It's, if you try to run a piece of code that was written 10, 15, or 20 years ago, especially like a piece of, of C code, or it's quite possible that it's not going to work. Even though that piece of code hasn't changed at all, it's, now it's broken. And people accept that this is normal, which I think is really unfortunate because it means that a lot of code just goes to waste. It has to be thrown away and constantly rewritten. So we're wasting a huge number, I don't know, millions of hours of work in this way. And I believe that the problem is that the foundations are constantly changing under your feet. Your code might not change, but everything else that your code depends on is changing. So how, how could we tackle code rot? Could we possibly design programs so that they will keep working correctly in 20, 30, or 50 years? Um, well, the first observation I'll make is that there is a class of systems where code rot is not a problem, which you're already familiar with. And this is emulators, basically. So if you take a program that runs on a, a Super Nintendo and you run it now, it's still going to work correctly. And you could, you could have a Super Nintendo emulator that will run those programs and it will, provided it follows the, the spec exactly, those programs are still going to work correctly. And the same goes for like old Atari programs and old Commodore 64 programs. Um, and the reason that those programs still works correctly, of course, is because the Super Nintendo and the Commodore 64 are not changing. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe that sounds a little crazy, right? Because 
the general problem is a little more complicated than that because as soon as your, your program starts interacting with the outside world, you can't guarantee that the outside world is not going to change. Uh, but I do think we can design systems to at least reduce the probability that code will break. Um, so the approach that I plan to take in Zeta is, is to be intentionally minimalistic. I think if Zeta remains smaller and simpler, if it provides less things, that we can make sure that what it does provide is better tested, that it has less corner cases, and so less change of less chances of, of breaking. And Zeta will intentionally try to avoid undefined behaviors. Uh, the C programming language has a lot of undefined behaviors, and it has undefined behaviors because they, they believe that that gives them a performance edge. Uh, in Zeta, we will make the opposite choice. We will say, if we find an undefined behavior, we will try to define the specification uh, to make it disappear. Uh, we will pick reliability over tiny performance gains. And the immutable version package manager also fits into this approach. It's a more functional approach to software development where when you import a package, you explicitly specify, I want version 15 of this package, and you know that version 15 is not going to change. And you know that this package is going to rely on features of the VM that are frozen. And so there's much less chance that it's going to break. Of course, you can still, if you interact with the outside world, if you interact with some external web API, then I can't promise that that external web API is not going to change. But I can at least you know, give you a chance of writing a piece of software that will still work in the future. And uh, functional graphics. This is another thing that I would like to explore with Zeta. Uh, Zeta will basically take a functional approach to 2D and 3D graphics. Uh, so it's sort of like back to the 1980s. Uh, instead of, of having polygons, Zeta will do per pixel graphics. So plotting individual pixels, which probably sounds completely crazy because it flies in the face of the way everybody else does 2D and 3D graphics right now. But I think I, think I can make this work fast. Um, the way that I plan to make this work fast is to provide sort of a parallel map operator where you, you pass a function that's a function of the coordinates x and y, and your function will uh, return the color of a pixel at that position, basically. And Zeta will try to automatically parallelize this function and run it on the GPU, essentially. So basically, it's a pixel shader. So Zeta will do graphics using pixel shaders. And the inspiration for this is, is uh, basically the demo scene, sign distance fields. If you are not familiar with that, I, I encourage you to check it out when you have time. Uh, it's possible to do some pretty amazing graphics in function in terms of sign distance fields and, and run on, on a GPU nowadays. And yeah, this is very, very different from, from, from Java, for instance, but the, the way in which this approach really shines, I think, is because Zeta only needs to, prov to provide one function. Zeta only needs to provide this operator where you pass it a function that gives the color of a pixel, and that is the Zeta graphics interface, basically. So it's really simple, and it's much less likely to break than, say, Java's approach, where Java exposes a billion different UI widgets, which basically don't operate the same on every platform. So progress so far. Um, so I have a VM with a simple optimizing interpreter. I've implemented some basic file I.O., audio, and graphics APIs. Uh, we have some beginnings of a standard library. There's a C++ implementation of Plush. There's a self-hosted implementation that currently work. And my friend uh, Marco has implemented uh, another language called Espresso, which is implemented in Python. Um, the roadmap, where I want to go next, I would like to uh, complete the Plush Bootstrap using serialization. So basically, the, the C Plush implementation is going to be deprecated soon, and only the self-hosted implementation will remain. I need to implement a garbage collector. So Zeta VM does not even have a garbage collector right now. It just allocates memory until uh, either your program terminates or things blow up. Um, I would like to implement inlining at the interpreter level. So the, the interpreter itself will do inlining, which I think should give it about a 10x 
uh, speed up. There's eventually going to be a JIT compiler and also uh, SPMD execution uh, on GPUs, uh, probably much later. So I realized that there's a bit of irony in the talk that I just gave, because I'm talking about eliminating code rot, but at the same time, the project that I'm presenting at this point is really young, and so it's going to change a lot. So if you write code for Zeta VM now, then for sure it's going to break, almost guaranteed. Um, but I think this is normal. I think before I can get to the point where uh, the bytecode format that Zeta runs is frozen, there needs to be a prototyping stage. There needs to be experimentation in order to figure out what works well and then stabilize things. So there will come a point where the, the bytecode format will be frozen and the core APIs provided by the, v the VM will be mostly unchanging. But that point is not there quite yet. So in conclusion, ZetaVM is a young open source project to create a VM with kind of a different take on computing platforms. The hope is that this VM will allow you to create a language of your own with very little code, uh, to instantly publish your language and make it available to everyone. And the goal of this VM is also to explore ideas and, and sort of uh, really try things that nobody else dares to try, that people in the industry don't dare to try because they're a little bit too out there. And I hope that one day uh, this VM will support a rich ecosystem of, of languages. And I am looking for contributors if you're interested in collaborating on this project. Uh, so that's it. If you're interested, you can check it out on GitHub. You can follow me on Twitter. And I'd also like to, uh, to give a shout out, uh, a big thank you to all the people who have contributed to the project so far. Thank you.